Thank you, Jim. I'd like to thank the executive committee for uh, inviting me this year and allowing my family to come. Uh, as you know, uh, Barrett's es uh, esophagus re is related to chronic injury of the uh, distal esophagus related to gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's a repair mechanism that occurs. Living in the South, we have f several issues that increases the incidence of reflux. Being in Atlanta, as you know, it's a world headquarters of Coca-Cola. Also, too, I think this guy's from Indiana, <laughs> but um, <laughs> he's got CVP. Anybody know what CVP is? Oh, very good. Chronic biscuit poisoning is what it is. So, <laughs> so we've got a lot of that down in the South, so you can tell this is... I think he coughed his stent up about a year ago or so. <laughs> All right, so that's what we're facing in the South. As you know, chronic inflammation, Barrett's uh, 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 intestinal metaplasia, Barrett's esophagus can lead to low-grade, high-grade dysplasia and eventually uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. As you know, within the, in the U.S., we've had a significant increase in esophageal cancer over the years and especially into, uh, uh, into this decade. And if you look at the time when someone's diagnosed with high-grade dysplasia, there's been a wide range of studies that have shown there's an incidence of anywhere from 10 to 73 percent of these patients can already have a malignancy present. But if you, if you look at these, it's very important to divide these two groups, high-grade dysplasia, into two um, groups in regards to risk. We have a unifocal lesion, a flat lesion, a very short segment of Barrett's esophagus. The risk of esophageal cancer is usually around in that 10 to 15 percent range, whereas if you've got multifocal disease, you've got a mass-like lesion, you've got longer segments, and also if you've got a complication of your Barrett's, such as a stricture, an ulcer formation, or a hyalur hernia present, then there's a higher incidence even up into that 73 percent range. So as, what we're going to focus on today is, is what should we do about high grade dysplasia in 2009. And the hallmark had always been surveillance. Uh, had been surveillance or esophagectomy, and the majority of us would agree with esophagectomy. So it's actually the, the treatment for high-grade dysplasia is the four E's, esophagectomy, endoscopic surveillance, endoscopic ablation, or endoscopic resection, uh, known as EMR. First, in regards to esophagectomy, which is all dear to our hearts, and uh, this is kind of shocking, as, as Jim was talking about yesterday, as as, as our medical colleagues are trying to come into our business, this was actually an updated guidelines from the American uh, College of Gastroenterology, uh, uh, Gastroenterology Society that said esophagectomy is no longer the necessary treatment response to high-grade dysplasia. And this just came out in 2008. If you look at the series that have been done for high-grade dysplasia, you can see a, a large number of cases, the largest uh, from Tom Rice uh, a couple years ago, complication rate was 39 percent. The mortality rate of all these studies combined was 1 percent. And at the time of um, the surgery, 40 percent of these patients already had uh, an invasive carcinoma present. And this was a series that I was involved in when I was in attending at Mayo. We looked back at this. Uh, Rob Hedrick, one of our fellows at that time, looked at 54 patients who had high-grade dysplasia. And, and out of that study, 35 percent of our patients had a malignancy noted, but if they had a normal EGD before, uh, just a single focus, only 10 percent had cancer, but if they had a complicated um, um, Barrett's high-grade dysplasia, uh, the, the risk was 52 percent. And what we found from that study, our median follow-up was five years, and high-grade dysplasia only, the five-year survival was 96 percent after esophagectomy, and if they had cancer, it was 68 percent, and two of those actually already had stage three disease. And in regards to quality of life, which is most important when you're talking about these patients, is these patients had a, a better than control, and when we matched uh, per patient and for age, better emotional role, and even and the cancer patients had worse than controls, but the majority of patients had better quality of life related to their esophagectomy. In regards to endoscopic surveillance, there has been a push of late, as these patients should be served if it's a, the low-grade, low-risk, um, high-grade patients that endoscopic surveillance sh um, should be done. As you know, a lot of people have tried to put endoscopic ultrasound uh, to follow these high-grade patients. As you know, it's very difficult when you have th there these very superficial areas that you can't really follow these, even with the new high-res um, uh, EUS, uh, which can really help to define this, but there's really not a good way to follow this endoscopically. 
So what's been um, um, adapted in, in from the our gastroenterologist that these patients should have a rigorous biopsy protocol uh, throughout surveillance every three month interval. So they're, bi they're biopsying, doing scopes in these patients every th three months or four quadrant biopsies every one centimeter. I think they're doing this, they're probably they're going to remove all the Barrett's eventually over time. Uh, histologic evaluation is needed to pathologists uh, to confirm that there is high grade dysplasia. Also it should be done in high volume centers that have expertise in, in Barrett's esophagus. And also too, they've recommended if they are going to have endoscopic surveillance, this should probably be in a clinical trial at that institution. And also too, they talk, as I talked about earlier, in the low risk patient who have comorbidities and so forth, these patients may be able to serve with endoscopic surveillance, but, but the jury's still out on this. When you're talking about endoscopic approach to treatment of Barrett's esophagus, the most important thing, the hallmark is to remove all intestinal metaplasia and try to do it in a circumferential fashion. It has to be uniform, reproducible, and the treatment depth has to be consistent. Uh, the, there can be no injury to submucosa or deeper structures because that will increase the risk of stricture formation. Most important thing is no buried glands. Also, it's got to be quick and efficient. And the number one thing, it's got to be able to retreat, and so, you can, so it's a user-friendly procedure. And the number one thing is prevent cancer um, uh, development. As you know, for, uh, for Barrett's esophagus, it, it's usually a pretty constant thickness, usually about 500 micrograms with a range of about 390 to 590. And the most important, as we talk about, is to avoid damage to the muscularis mucosa where strictures can form, and, the, and also, too, to have complete removal of the Barrett's esophagus. When we're talking about doing an ablation of uh, uh, Barrett's esophagus, ablation depth is usually at this upper level above the muscularis mucosa. As you know, EMR will go down to this level here, a full thickness, a partial thickness of the esophagus, and obviously surgical death is the entire esophagus. If you talk about mucosal ablation techniques, it's broken down into um, three areas, thermal uh, ablation, uh, chemical ablation, and there's a new technology which we don't have time to talk about today is uh, cryoablation, uh, which is uh, gaining some, some speed in some communities. Um, the the ta challenges with ablation techniques has been it's always been a point and shoot. It's very technically demanding. There's no uniform ablation that can be obtained most of the time. Uh, the visual endpoint is incomplete. And also, too, you've got to remember that, remember that the distal esophagus is not round. It's an oval structure. So when you're trying to ablate these areas, that you can have difficulty. And also, too, you've got to have repeat therapy. Thermal. This is uh, just an example of argon plasma coagulation. Looks like after one of your stints there, Dr. Freeman, but I don't know if I could tolerate this too well. The problem with the argon beam and the YAG laser has been buried glands. And so, it's, so that has been one of the problems with this. And a lot of places are not doing argon plasma coagulation. Also, too, because it doesn't really complete the ablation, only about a third of the patients, partial and two thirds. You can have the buried glands. Stricture formation is very high in these patients, almost a third. Anti-reflux therapy should be done. And surveillance needs to continue after these thermal ablations. Chemical ablation, as you know, most commonly is a photodynamic therapy. As you know, what occurs with por por porphyrin is given. It goes to the uh, neoplastic cells, makes it photosensitized. You use a non-thermal laser, which creates a cingulate or a, a free radical, which causes the destruction of the, the cancer cells. And this is an example of patients with uh, Barrett's esophagus and cancer, significant uh, necrosis, but at three months, just an excellent uh, um, outcome uh, of the GE junction. The problem, as you know, with PDT, there's been a lot of uh, complications with photosensitization, stricture formation anywhere from 30 to 40 percent. And again, there is an issue in regards to uh, um, uh, buried glands. Uh, this was a nice study that came out in 2003 from Overholt that actually looked at patients who were randomized two to one from PDT plus a miprazole versus a miprazole only. And then they, they were treated and then they were uh, biopsied every three months for four quadrant biopsies. And what they found, they eliminate a high-grade dysplasia in 77% of the patients with the PDT arm, whereas only 39% in the non-PDT arm with um, uh, PPEIs only. The response was long-lasting. The majority of these patients uh, did not uh, uh, progress into malignant.